I'd like to welcome you to church once again and also like to welcome those that are now joining us in our live stream. We have been exploring the Paul's letter to the church at Rome and we are now in chapter 8. And so our reading today begins with verse 28 and this is perhaps one of the passages in the Bible that has been memorized almost as much as John 3.16. Because it is a tremendous promise that is being given to us. And if you've ever been going through a hard time, and who hasn't, it is a promise to lay hold of. But it's not just for when you're going through a hard time. This is a promise. And so as we read, let us remember that as Paul wrote these words, it was the Holy Spirit who inspired him, inviting the Holy Spirit to speak to us. And here's what we read. And we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. For those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the likeness of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those he predestined, he also called. And those he called, he also justified. Those he justified, he also glorified. Join me as we go to the Lord in prayer, seeking his guidance in the study of his word. Lord, we come before you acknowledging that we are completely, utterly dependent upon you if this word is going to come to life. We invite you and through the power of your Holy Spirit today to speak to our hearts and to speak to our lives. I confess, Lord, that I'm totally inadequate to do this. And I ask for the anointing power of your spirit. I confess to you that I am sinful, Lord, and I ask for your cleansing, that you would make me a vessel fit for your use. And more than anything, I'm asking that you will be glorified here today. May we focus on you and our relationship with you. And it's in the blessed name of Jesus that we pray. Amen. When Jesus said, I have come so that they may have life and have it to the full, he wasn't talking about an abundance of stuff. He wasn't talking about material wealth. He wasn't talking about the accumulation of things. What Jesus was talking about was living life to the fullest extent. Living life as God intended for it to be. He's not writing because he wants you to be happy. He's not writing this so that you can have fun. And I know in our world we get the idea that being happy and having fun means the abundant life. But... Happiness doesn't last. In fact, that's why it's called happiness is because it's contingent upon what is happening. You can go to what's called the happiest place on the earth, to Disney. Take your five-year-old child there and just see how long they're happy in the happiest place on earth. Pretty soon they're miserable in the happiest place on earth. And so that's not what the concern is in this when Jesus speaks here. He wants us to experience real life. Life as God intended it. And the abundant life is not contingent upon circumstances. It has nothing to do with what is going on in my life. We can have life to the fullness regardless of what is happening. And in order to experience the fullness of life, we need to know that all things happen according to God's plan. And in fact, that is a truth we need to constantly remind ourselves of. Because if we're not reminding ourselves, we will forget. And if we fail to remember, then we're going to go through life feeling frustrated. We're going to feel like we've been cheated in this life. We're going to feel like life's not Fair. I remember when my girls were growing up and they would use that statement. It's not fair. And I did what any wise parent would do. I sat down with them and said, 
Who told you life was fair? Because it's not. And yet we get this idea into our mind. And what we really need to be remembering is that God is working in all of these things for our good. And so Paul reminds us that God has a purpose. I want to read this from the New American Standard. I think that the translators there really captured what Paul was saying. And here's what we read. And we know, just say that with me, we know. We know. No, you don't. We know. We know. See, you got to get this. We know this. We know that God causes all things. Say that with me. All things. I mean, all things. We know that God causes all things to work together for good for those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. And so as children of God, and we've been looking at that, children of God means that we have actually been adopted into God's family, that we have accepted that invitation to come to Jesus Christ, believing in him as our Savior, come to Jesus Christ, committing our life to him. And when we do that, then we become children of God. And as children of God, we know that we are here for a reason. We know that there is a purpose in our life. And we also know that everything that happens has a purpose in our life. There is a reason for every event. I mean every event everything and we really need to hold on tenaciously to that truth and so as we look at God's purpose the first thing that Paul tells us here is that God's purpose is comprehensive all things he says think about that that means there is not one single event in your life that God does not use for your good not one every event in your life. Everything that's ever happened, God uses for your good. That means there is no incident, no circumstance, no matter how great we may think that it is or how trivial it may seem to us, that is without purpose or meaning in your life. And so when Satan comes along and he's trying to tempt us to really start feeling sorry for ourselves, and we can do that, then that's when we really need to remember, instead of asking, why is this happening to me? Remember, God is at work. He's not finished with you. You are under construction. You are a masterpiece in progress. And so in your life, what God is doing, all these things are comprehensive to his plan. But not only are they comprehensive, they're also cooperative. God causes all things to work together. That means the seemingly independent events in your life that feel like they don't fit into it whatsoever. It looks like it's just a meaningless, jumbled up mess. That it's all tied together. Now that can be hard to see. Because the truth is, very rarely do we ever see the whole picture? And so imagine this. Your life is fit together like a jigsaw puzzle. How many of you do jigsaw puzzles? Uh, oh, well, there's a few of you here that do that. And so imagine your life as a giant jigsaw puzzle. It's got about 15,000 pieces, and you've got a box, and you dump it out, but here's the thing. There's no picture on the box. You don't know where this is going. That's how it is with your life, right? You don't have a picture that says, this is exactly what this is going to look like when it's done. And so you dump out those 15,000 pieces and you pick up one piece and it's like, I don't have a clue how this fits in. And sometimes you're doing the puzzle and it feels like there's a piece that's missing. You ever done that? 
I mean, you, you've got this little corner up here done finally. It's, you're seeing how this part's coming together. But there's that one piece, and so you're looking through all of those other 14,500 pieces here, and you can't find that one. Something is missing. See, that's the way we see life. But yet, here's what you know. It all eventually comes together one piece at a time. That's how God is working in our lives. I want you to consider an example from the Bible. His name was Joseph. You may know Joseph's story. He's found in the book of Genesis. And as you begin looking at Joseph's life, it really tells how God does this. Now, the first thing that you discover about Joseph is when he is born, he is born into a dysfunctional family. Now, that's not good. His mother... Father, he's got 10 brothers at that point in his life. And he, those 10 brothers that he has, all 10 of them despise him. That's not good. Can you imagine being the youngest brother and all 10 of your older brothers hate you? That's not good. And they actually hated him. In fact, one day, He's older now. He's 17 years old. His father has sent him out to go check on his brothers, to take a message to them. He goes out looking for them. He eventually finds out where they are, and they see him coming in the distance. And they begin plotting how to kill him. We'll kill him. We'll take that coat that Dad gave to him when he didn't give us a coat. We'll dip it in animal blood and tear it up and say, this is all we found. I mean, these guys, that's hate. And he shows up, and boy, they have pounced on him. Only there was one brother there that says, let's not kill him. Let's throw him in this dry cistern. Now, that's not as bad as wanting to kill you, but have you ever been thrown down into a dry cistern? That's bad, too. See, this is not good. And now in this dry cistern, he doesn't even have a clue what's going to happen to him. But he hears his brothers up at the top, and boy, he is the subject they're talking about. And as they're talking, they're figuring out what are we going to do with him. And they finally come up with this idea, well, we might as well get a little money out of this. We'll go ahead and do the rope deal we talked about. We'll tear it up, dip it in blood, tell daddy's dead, but we'll just sell him. And so a caravan is going by, and they sell him as a slave. Now, that's not good. Then he is carried off to a foreign land to Egypt. That's not good. Once he is in Egypt, he's sold once again as a slave. That's not good. It was Potiphar who purchased him. He was a high official in Pharaoh's court. And so David is now a slave in Potiphar's home, and Potiphar notices Joseph. He sees this guy is reliable. You can trust him. You can give him a job to do and he does it. You don't have to worry about him stealing anything. And so as he notices Joseph, he actually makes him in command of his entire household. That's good. But he's still a slave. But not only had Potiphar noticed Joseph, Miss Potiphar did too. And what Miss Potiphar noticed was that Joseph was handsome and well built. I don't know whether that one's good or bad. <laughs> How could I? I mean, yeah. You, know. you think it's good, but the fact that Miss Potiphar noticed him, and when she noticed him, she wants to have sex with him. That's not good. And so Joseph refuses her time after time. That's good. But it's not good because she feels rejected and angry. And so one day she's had all the rejection she can take and she accuses Joseph of trying to rape her. That's not good. He is falsely accused and falsely imprisoned. And so Joseph is now in prison. That's not good. 
And in prison, the warden notices Joseph just as Potiphar had. That's good. Same thing. You can trust this guy. You can put things underneath him. And so what he does is he puts Joseph over all the prisoners. That's good. But he's still in prison. That's not good. And while he's in prison, one of the prisoners that he met had been the cupbearer for Pharaoh, and he had displeased the Pharaoh. And so he was thrown into prison, and he has a dream. And he's really troubled by his dream, and Joseph can tell he's troubled. He's, what's going on here? He tells him, I had a dream. I don't know what it means. And Joseph says, well, God can tell what it means. You tell me. I'll see if God will tell me what your dream means. And so he tells him his dream. God tells Joseph how to interpret that dream. And he says, well, it means that you're going to be restored back to your position with Pharaoh. That's good for him. Joseph is still in jail. That's not good. But when you are restored, remember me, Joseph says. That's good. Maybe there's a way out. But he forgets all about Joseph. That's not good. He's restored to his position. Joseph is still in jail for the next two years. And then Pharaoh has a dream, and no one can interpret it. And then suddenly the cupbearer goes, oh, yeah, there was this guy when I was in prison that could interpret dreams. And so they call for Joseph to come to Pharaoh. Pharaoh tells him his dream. It's the same thing. I can't interpret it, but God knows dreams, and God will tell me if I need to know what it is to tell you with that. So Pharaoh tells him his dream, and so he says, okay, here's what it means. There's going to be seven years of plenty in Egypt. That's good. It's going to be followed by seven years of famine. That's not good. And so you need to take the seven years of plenty and prepare for the seven years of famine. Pharaoh says, that's a good plan. I'm going to put you in charge of it. That's good. Joseph is now out of prison. He is over this project that Pharaoh has. Pharaoh does the same thing Potiphar does and the warden does. He notices Joseph. This guy is smart. He's trustworthy. He's reliable. He promotes Joseph to second command in the kingdom, only second to Pharaoh. That's good. He saves all of Egypt from the famine. But not only does he save Egypt, he also saves his family. Now his brothers don't have a clue where he is. His father thinks he's dead. Joseph is down here. They're having a famine. It's the same famine. And they know there's food down in Egypt. So they go down there to get food so they can live. And so he saves his family. Now that's good. You see, as you begin looking at Joseph's story, you understand some things here. Most of what we talked about was not good. But all of it worked together for good. You see, you take Joseph's story and you take one bad thing out of it and suddenly the whole story unravels. If his brothers hadn't hated him, he would have never wound up in Egypt. Everybody would have just died from the famine. That's not good. I mean, that's the end of the story with that one. You see, you take any one of those bad things that happened to Joseph out and suddenly the whole story falls apart. And so God has a purpose in our life. And we see that that purpose is comprehensive and it is also cooperative. But as we noted in Joseph's life, it has a concluding goal. All things work together together for good. See, that's what Paul was talking about when we were back in Romans chapter 5 when he says, we also rejoice in our suffering. That sounds stupid, doesn't it? We rejoice in our suffering. Why? Because we know that suffering produces perseverance, perseverance, character, character, hope, and hope does not disappoint us. All things are working together for good. Even the bad things are working together together. He didn't say that all these things are good because we know they're not. Yet God redeems them and he achieves his goal of working good in your life. Now here's the thing. You may not see the results in this life, but that doesn't make the promise any less real. See, even when we don't see the end, we have the assurance that there is a concluding goal where God is working for our good. 
And so God has a purpose. It's comprehensive. It's cooperative. It has a concluding goal. But the characters are selected. If you'll notice, this is not a universal promise. This is not a promise for all humanity. This is a promise that is given to the children of God. For those who have responded to Jesus Christ as their Lord and their Savior. He says, this is for those who love the Lord. Now, if you remember, Jesus identified that as the first and greatest commandment. You shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all your strength and all your might. And God even has a plan to accomplish that. You see, God is working in our lives, and we read in John chapter 4 that we love him because he first loved us. And we read in Romans chapter 5, God demonstrated his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. You see, this takes us right back to the cross. This is what God says, I love you so much. I want you with me. I want you to be a child of mine. And so I've got to take care of this sin problem you have. And so I am sending my son to this earth. He's going to die on the cross to pay your sin debt so that you can be with me. And so when we look at the cross, it's showing this is the full extent of the love that God has for us so that we might love him in return. And he says this promise is for those who love him and for those who have been called according to his purpose. And what that's reminding us of is that we were not called by God because we merited it. It's not like God was looking down here at us and says, wow, boy, that Glenn Perkins is really something. I need him in my kingdom. Had nothing to do with me other than God loved me. I had nothing to offer. You have nothing to offer. It is all by the grace of God. And it's for all who will simply receive it. And so God not only has a purpose, he has a process to accomplish it. I mean, what good is a purpose if you don't have a way of fulfilling it, right? I mean, we can have a lot of things that we want to happen in life, but there's got to be a way to make it happen. And so God has a process to accomplish his purpose. We begin reading in verse 29. For those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the likeness of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those he predestined, he also called. Those he called, he also justified. Those he justified, he also glorified. See, there are five steps that are involved with God accomplishing his purpose in our life. And it all begins with the fact that God foreknew you. See, if you'll notice, it says those whom he foreknew, not that which he foreknew. Now, it is true that God is omniscient. That means God knows everything. But this isn't dealing with that. This is dealing with the fact that it's personal that God knew you. God knew that you were going to be here before you were ever born. In fact, God knew exactly what you were going to be like. Now, I want you to think about the implications of that. If it weren't for DNA, we wouldn't have any clue on this. We would think, okay, we know there's a few things that can be different here. But do you know that at conception, there are 64 trillion combinations that you are a one in 64 trillion shot. The odds of you happening again are one in 64 trillion. I mean, and to think that God saw through all of those possibilities and he knew that you would be you and that you would be here now. You see, the Bible tells us that before the foundations of this earth, God knew that you would be here. So what does that mean? It means you're that important. You are important to God. You're not an afterthought. Now, I know that when some children come into this world, there's been a lot of planning that's gone on. 
Some parents are, you know, okay, we're going to have kids, and uh, now's the time we'll have our first kid, and things go kind of like they planned on with that. And so that, that you could say it was planned, but some folks come into this world as a surprise. Wasn't planned at all. But you're not an afterthought with God. It was planned. You would be here exactly as the person you are. That's how important you are to God. In fact, God knows you better than you know you. He knows things about you that you don't know about you. He knows you intimately, every detail, because he loves you. And those he foreknew, he predestined. Boy, if there's any word in the Bible that has caused more controversy... More misunderstanding than that word predestination. People just mess this one all up. See, there are some people that actually think that means that God has decided beforehand, which is what the word predestined means, that God has decided beforehand who actually is going to heaven and who's going to go to hell before you're ever born on this earth, and you really don't have a choice in it, that you can't even affect the outcome of that. Listen to me. That is nowhere near the truth. Doesn't come close. Predestination has nothing to do with eternity for everyone. In fact, if you notice in reading this, this is a word that, has on, that is only applied to those who are already believers in Christ. See, it's not of talking about those who have not yet come to Christ or those who have, will never come to know him. Predestination is for those who are in Christ, and it's always a good thing. And so when it says he foreknew you and he predestined, that means this is going back to that purpose, all things work together for good. And so God has predestined. Now, what is it that he's predestined? that you would be conformed to the likeness of his son, Jesus. That's what predestination is all about. In other words, this is what we call sanctification. We've looked at that as we've been studying in the book of Romans. Paul's sort of tying these things up here. And sanctification means that I am growing and becoming more and more like Christ. That's God's plan. When God foreknew you, his plan was is that you would become more like Christ. John writes in 1 John chapter 3, What we will be has not yet been made known. Can I get an amen on that? Whew. Sure glad this isn't all there is with it. Oh, man. I think I'd go shoot myself if I thought God no better than this for Glenn. What, shall we, what we shall be has not yet been made known, but we know that when he appears, we shall be like him. God has predestined that as a child of God, you will be like Jesus. And he says, those he predestined, he called. Now, that is a reminder that it's the Holy Spirit who began working in your life, drawing you to come to Christ. You may not even have been aware of it at the time. You may have been clueless as to what was going on, but God loved you, God was wooing you, and the Holy Spirit was working in your life to draw you to Christ so that you would respond to him by faith. Now, it is true, God calls everyone, but not everyone's going to accept it. There'll be some who actually reject it. Now, that's really not what he's talking about here. That's really the doctrine of election, and we'll talk about that later on. But since I mentioned that word, let me go ahead and share this. Here's how election works. God has voted for you. The devil's voted against you. And you cast the deciding vote. And so in that sense, God has called us all. But here he's talking about the fact that when you come to know Christ, the initiative was initiated by God, not by you. See, sometimes we can get this idea, and I've, I've heard people share this part of their story. You know, my life was so messed up, and I was really looking for answers. I looked so long in the wrong places. And then I finally started looking into religion, and I finally found God, and I finally found the answer that I was looking for. 
Well, I'm glad that you know Jesus Christ. But here's the part of the story they missed. He was pursuing you long before you were pursuing him. God was leading you to him. It was how all things work together. He's taking these things in your life that's making your life miserable to lead you to him. To finally come to that place of truth. See, those he called means God has been pursuing you. He wants you in a relationship with him. And those he called, he justified. Now, we've also just looked at this quite a bit in the book of uh, Romans, if you remember. We spent a lot of weeks talking about justification. See, justification is where God covers your sin with the blood of Jesus. That's called atonement. And he covers you with the righteousness of Christ. And you are actually made righteous. It's not your own righteousness, but it is the righteousness of God. And so justification is when God brings this about in our lives where he actually imputes us with the righteousness of Jesus. And so when God looks at you, it is as if you never sinned. See, he doesn't look at our righteousness because we don't have any. The Bible says our righteousness is like filthy rags. But he sees the righteousness of Jesus because that's what we're covered in. He sees you as pure and clean and acceptable in his sight. And those he justified, he glorified. Now, Paul is talking about this as if it's already happened. That's how certain it is. It hasn't happened yet, but the certainty, if you are a child of God, the certainty of you being glorified is 100%. Can't miss it. And we talked about this the last few weeks here, if you remember. But this justification was that promise that when Jesus comes back, we will be revealed as the children of God. And when we are revealed as his children, not that we will just see glory, but we will participate in the glory of God. We become joint heirs with Christ, if you remember. And I know we talk about this, and it's hard for us to comprehend what it means to be glorified. We think about having a glorified body, and we will. And the way that we look at that is mostly through negatives. That means I'm going to have a body that don't hurt anymore. My back's not going to hurt anymore. I'm not going to get tired. I'm not going to get weak. Uh, I'm not going to get fat. I mean, you know, we could go on and on with what it's not going to mean. But we really don't have a clue as to how spectacular it's going to be. But Paul says that when he comes back, we will be glorified. And here's what it means. That's when we will be like him. It's a reminder, you are still that work in progress. God's not finished yet. And as you are a work in process, that means the process is going to involve pain. I um, don't like that. But it is. It's a part of the process. It means it's going to involve work. See, if we're going to become like Christ, we've got to be working at that. It just doesn't happen in this life. You do things to help you grow in Christ so that you are right now becoming more and more like him. It's going to involve tears, disappointments, heartaches, sorrow, and it'll involve sin. You're going to stumble. You're going to fall. And you'll experience forgiveness. And there's so much more that we're going to experience as this process continues on. But that's it. It's a process. It's not yet complete. Because God is not finished. And here's the good news. He will finish what he starts. We may start projects that we never finish but not God. You're one of his projects. You're that masterpiece that God is working on and he is not finished working on you yet. We're still under construction. Let's pray together. 
Lord, we come before you and we thank you so much for your word. We ask, Lord, that you'll just take it and use it in our hearts and in our lives. Draw us closer and closer to you. And it's in the name of Jesus that we pray. Amen. I invite us all to stand.